All right, let's go with lab nine in the solution video. We started working on this in class, and what I have here is all the stuff we were working on. I'm just gonna start from scratch. Uh, but first of all, let's talk about the question. We are creating an R script that can generate simulated data for the following repeated measures design. The dependent variables assume to come from a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one. There's a repeated measures factor with five levels. We're calling them down two, down one, control up one and up two. We're assuming the control group has no effect and um, down one and down two shift the mean down by one and two standard deviations respectively and up one and up two shift the mean up by one and two standard deviations respectively. Also, there's six subjects in the experiment. They're each measured once in each condition. The subjects are assumed to be different from one another. So they will have different baseline means in the control condition, but they will all be influenced by the independent variable in the exact same way. So no interaction between subjects and the independent variable. All right, uh, first of all, I'm going to clear my workspace. Let's make a tibble. This is effectively what we want to what we want to do. Um, we talked about this in class. We have six subjects. Each of them are measured in each of the levels of the independent variable, and we need to create simulated data here. So I've just created a DV column with a bunch of zeros to represent where we're going to put some simulated data. All right, let me get all this stuff and delete it. So we want to do two things here. The first thing we want to do is simulate, well, we could do either first. We want to simulate the effect of the independent variable. And we want to respect the idea that this is a independent, sorry, this is a repeated measures design and different people are, are assumed to be different. Effectively, that means different people, we could think about it as they will have different means when it comes to the control group. So if we measured somebody in the control group, any given person is gonna have a different value. And um, let's see if we can build that in. The first thing I wanna do is see if we can accomplish this part. Let's build in the effect of the independent variable. In lab eight, I showed you something that you can do with the R norm function. So let's think about um, this for a second. I'll just, I'll redo the example. So normally we'll, we'll use the R norm function with Something like, well, here's an example where we're sampling one value from a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So we just get one value every time. We can change the number of values we get. So here we're, we're getting five different ones. Five different samples from this same normal distribution. Now what's interesting is, go back to one sample, we can actually provide a vector here, a vector of means. So consider this vector of means, negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. Let's see what happens. All right, we're sampling one value. We still get one value back, but um, we've got these five different means in here. So what's happening is it's sampling one value from a standard from a normal distribution with a mean of negative two and a standard deviation of one. There's five here. 
if we increase the number of samples to five, watch what happens. It's, it's kind of easy to see. The first value is being sampled from a normal distribution with a mean of negative two. The second value is being sampled from a normal distribution with a mean of negative one. And the third is being sampled from a normal with a mean of zero and a mean of one and a mean of two and so on. So this is a kind of quick way where we could sample multiple or we could sample values from multiple normal distributions at the same time. If we put this to 10, the number of samples that we take, what happens is it kind of repeats. So it'll take the it'll take one sample each from each of these five dis distributions, and then it'll do it again. So we get a kind of sequence from minus two, from minus one, from zero, from one, from two, from minus two, from minus one, from zero, from one, from two. It's really easy to see this if you set the standard deviation to a smaller value, and then the numbers will be really close to the means. So minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, minus one, sorry, that's uh, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two. I'm gonna leave the standard deviation at one here. If we put a six, sorry, um, we have five, five numbers to sample for each person. If we have six times five, that's six people times five. 30 values. This would be a fast way. Let's put this in the DV location here. This would be a fast way to sample um, values for each subject in this design where each of the values, so this one's coming from a normal with a, a mean of negative two, this one's coming from a normal of mean of negative one, this one's coming from a normal with zero, and this one's with one, and this one's with two, and so on, and then it repeats. So this is a fast way to build in uh, two of the assumptions. We're sampling from normal distributions with a standard deviation of one. When the control condition occurs, we're sampling from a distribution with a mean zero. And we've built in the prescriptions for this effect here, where these two conditions have one standard deviation shifts down and these ones have standard deviation shifts up. Now, what we haven't done here is assumed that different subjects are different. Um, let's try to build that in. And we could do that in more than one way. But first of all, let me, let's just plot this data and see what we're looking at. All right, so this is, um, what we're looking at right now, I'm gonna rearrange this x-axis so that the control group is in the middle here and that the, you know, the down one, down two, up one, up two. See, I was imagining that we could have a nice graph that's just a line going up where the middle group's in the middle and then the ones on the left go down and the ones on the right go up. And we're not getting that ordering because of the alphabetical ordering of the factors. So let me just quick change that. Okay, so what I've done in between creating the data and plotting it, I've just gone and said, let's take our independent variable factor. And let's make it a factor and let's declare the levels to be in this order. So now when we look at the plot, we've got our control group in the middle and and so on. Let's make the standard deviation that we're sampling from really small, 0 0.0, and see what happens when we do this. All right, the standard deviation now is very, very small. We do have um, data for six different subjects here, but it's 
so close together for each subject that's just lining right up. We can see that um, all six subjects in the control condition have a mean of zero. If we were to look at the data, we could see subject one, yeah, the, their value we, sam value we sampled in the control condition was basically zero. Same for subject two, same for subject three, and so on. What I'm intending to show you is that we have successfully programmed the main effect of the independent variable here. Down one goes down by one standard deviation, down two goes down by two, up one goes up by one, and up two goes up by two. See, uh, zero, one, two, zero, negative one, negative two. However, we've got six subjects, and it's pretty obvious that in terms of simulating their data, we are not simulating that our subjects are different from one another. And the way we're going to simulate their differences is to assume they are different in some kind of stable fashion. Um, and to do that, we need to create um, some systematic differences between the participants and add that systematic difference into our simulated data. So we could do that in a couple different ways. What I think I'm going to do is load up the dplyr library and add a little pipe here. I'm going to use the mutate function. And I'm going to basically modify the sampled values for the dependent variable one more time. And there's a couple ways we could do this. Um, let me show you something kind of straightforward, and then we will make it a little bit more reasonable as a simulation pr procedure. Okay. So let's say the sixth subject was um, the kind, if you're looking at this graph, let's say subject six is going to have overall lower scores and subject five a little bit higher and subject three a little bit higher and subject two a little bit higher and subject one a little bit higher. So the, that's how the differences between the subjects will be. We should get um, six parallel lines and with, you know, going kind of going up like that. So how could we build that in? Well, let's use the rep function. And I'm imagining a sequence that goes from, so negative two, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three. We've got six people. Let's go from negative three to two. I'm just thinking about this sequence right here. And if I say there's, uh, I want to repeat each of those numbers five times, we get a sequence like this. Now what I'm imagining I would do is take the original values in dv and add these constants to them. Now how am I doing it? So subjects one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, the way I talked about it was it's going to be in reverse, so going from 2 to negative 3, let's say. We can add that in. So if we run this, let's take a look now. We should have shifted subjects 6 down by a negative 3, all of the values. So you can see their control score here is negative 3. We've shifted all of the values for subject five down by negative two and their control starts at negative two and so on. So now when we look at the plot, we've got six different participants uh, who are starting out at different places, um, but the main effect is consistent across all of the participant data. So this kind of situation would satisfy this question, um, I realize here I wasn't very specific about 
how to simulate the differences between subjects. So I'd accept different kinds of answers. This would be an acceptable answer, what I just did. I would guess that in a laboratory situation, you know, if you have six people show up and contribute data in your experiment, uh, the differences between them are going to be random. You won't know who's going to be lower or higher on your measure, but you expect people on average to be different. So what we could do is <clears throat> do something like this instead of, uh, but let's make it a little bit more random, I guess. So I'm just going to sample, uh, we've got six subjects. I'm gonna sample six different values from a normal distribution distributed between our mean of zero, standard deviation one, so there we have six values. My intention is that these specific values will serve as the control condition mean for each participant. And they'll control how the lines kind of go up and down for each participant. And we, we're gonna replicate each of these values five times. So let's take a look at that. So now we don't have consistent differences between the subjects. Um, the, the, sorry, the, the spread of where these lines are falling is gonna change every time. It'd be easier to see that, I think, if we, let's, can we make the, let's, um, I'm just gonna quickly make the subjects variable, a factor. When we do this, ggplot will automatically give colors to the factor structure. So if we say color equals subjects, it's gonna color one, two, three, four, five, and six with these different colors. You can change that, but you can see here the ordering. Um, of these things. And every time we run this, we're gonna get a different ordering, right? Simulating the idea that every time you run six people in this experiment, the differences between subjects are going to be random. Uh, however, the uh, differences between the levels are going to be very consistent because in this example, we have a very consistent effect. So just one more time to show that this is changing every time we do that. All right, I've lost the ability to pause, so I hope I'm just gonna keep going. There's, there might be some, uh, some, <laughs> some pausing type of moments where I'm stumbling through what I'm doing. Uh, actually, I wanna see, sorry. No. Doesn't look like I can, how about, let's do that. If I go here, all right, let's go to question two. We're asked to run a simulation to determine the proportion of experiments that would return a significant result for the above design. Assume alpha equals 0.05. So I'm gonna do that. Let's make a code snippet. We can, come in here and grab some of the code we made to create the simulated data. And let's see here. So that will give us our data. This turns the independent variable into a factor. This one will turn the subject variable into a factor. This is very important. Let's go ahead and run the ANOVA here. So it's the dependent variable as a function of the independent variable, and it's between, or it's within subjects. So we add the error term, and we supply the name of the column for the subject variable, and then the name of the data frame. So that's gonna conduct 
our ANOVA. Finally, or well, not finally, what we want to do is save the result. We could look at the summary if we wanted. Whoops. So there's the ANOVA. Um, ooh, looks like the p value, the f value is 104,849. Oh boy. I've picked some funny values here. <laughs> um, I wonder if I should change this. I might, I might just go ahead and change this because every time we run this experiment, we're going to get Um, ridiculously high F values. So, hmm. I suppose the answer to this question is probably going to be uh, 100 percent power based on how it's presently defined um, modify the question just a little bit and i'll update this on the website Sorry, assume that the effect of the levels of the IV um, are increments of 0.1 of a standard deviation rather than increments of one as in the above example. This should be a little bit more reasonable. So to, to do that, we can just put a point one, point negative one, point negative two, point one, point two, and uh, oh, actually, forgot to change this to a one. Oh. So I'd been simulating this incorrectly. Right. Okay. This looks a little more reasonable here in terms of what you'd expect to find. So once we add the variability back, uh, the lines get a little, a little bit more messy. So what happens here, I'm just curious. See if we can leave the values at negative two, negative one, one, and two. So our F values are a little bit more back in the normal range. This is still a huge effect, my guess is almost all cases will be significant. That's what I'm seeing here. All right, so we'll we'll keep the the little change that we made. We're going to put this back to point two, point one. And we could think of this, you know, in the one condition down to, we have a negative 0.2 standard deviation shift. In the most extreme other condition up by two, we have a positive 0.2 standard deviation shift. So there's a total difference here of about 0.4 standard deviations. And you could think about that in terms of Cohen's D a little bit, uh, but this independent variable across its range is maximally going to change the dependent variable by 0.4 standard deviations, which is 
<laughs> kind of like a medium type of effect. All right. So if we look at this, now we're getting some results that aren't significant. I'm guessing we will sometimes find significant results. Well, that was close. There's one. <laughs> okay, let's simulate this out. So for example, I'm just going to put the summary function here. And we can inspect this to find sync. Oh, how does this go? Oh, it's within subjects. Nope. There we go. It's probably a two. It takes a while to find the thing we're looking for. There we go. Error within. So what do we get with that? A table. And there we go. The p value here. The first value of that. Okay, it took a little digging, but we found the p value we're looking for. I want to save this p value. All right, let's set up a quick loop. So we're going to go for i in 1 to 1000. So this will run our simulation a thousand times. I'm going to save the, I'm going to create a little storage lo location for saving the p-value every time. This starts out being empty, but as i goes from 1 to 1000, we can save the p-values in the ith index of um, this object. Cool. So we can run the simulation here, and I don't think this will take too long. There we've We've completed the simulation. So let's find out how many of these things are less than 0.05. So this is going to be all of the all of the times where the null hypothesis was rejected. We could find out how many that was. 84. So that's out of a thousand. All right, so this design um, has power 0.08 to detect an effect. That's with six subjects and with the um, effect sizes as programmed here. Now, this isn't part of the question, but just to illustrate, if we were to change some of the properties of this design, you know, we'd be able to have a uh, larger power. So just briefly, let's say we wanted to run 12 people in this condition or in this experiment. We could change all the sixes here to 12, and then we'd be running um, a version with n equals 12. And we could redo this simulation and figure out uh, what the power would be. So that's increased our power by a little bit. I'm going to set this back to 6, which is where we started. All right. And let's move on to this next question. Demonstrate that the Godin and Baddeley example data from the textbook 
which used a two by two repeated measures design can be analyzed with one sample t-tests to return the same results. Specifically, show the one sample t-tests for each main effect and the interaction. Well, I'll say this is a little tricky, but the idea here is to recognize that when you have repeated measures with only two levels, uh, what the ANOVA is essentially doing is equivalent to a one sample t-test or a pair sample t-test, depending on how you configure the data. So last semester, we looked at how the one sample t-test is the same as the paired sample t-test. And we're just going to generalize that here a little bit. So what I would do is head over to the lab nine um, uh, sorry, the lab nine lab. This is would be on the website. I'm just going to go grab it from the R markdown that I made. What I'm looking for is the code where we ran the Godin and Badley experiment example from the textbook. So here it is, we can just grab all of this and you could copy that off the website, put it in here. And we should see uh, first that we've done the ANOVA and there's a main effect of learning place, main effect of testing place and uh, interaction here. And then we've got a graph. So the purpose of this question is to see if we can reproduce the main effect of learning, the main effect of testing, and the interaction only with one sample t-tests. This is a different way to think about the design. So let's do that. One sample t-test solutions. main effect of learning place. All right. So here's the data set. And the main effect of learning place is the average effect of recall on land versus under sea. That's not represented in this data. This is um, not collapsed over learning place. So let's quickly do that. What I want to do here is group by learning place and what's it called subjects. to make a variable called mean recall and calculate the mean. So we can see here for subject one, we have on land under sea, subject two on land under sea, subject three on land under sea. And these are their mean recalls scores for each of the learning places. So at this point, I. I suppose if we wanted to, just for illustration purposes, so I've, I've saved this data frame into the learning place means data frame. So if we were to do a t-test here, a paired sample t-test, Let's just do that real quick. Mean recall, oops, as a function of learning place, uh, 
Is this going to work? I don't know. Let's see. Paired equals true. And data equals learning place means. Let's see. Does that work? So my question is, am I getting the same p-value for the main effective learning place as I am from the ANOVA? We should be able to inspect the console here. So the learning place p-value from the ANOVA is 0.23. And yep, we've got the same p-value here. If you remember that f squared, sorry, t squared is the same as f. So if we took this t value, squared it, we should get this f value here. Close enough to 2 for me. All right, so we've demonstrated one way in which we can compute the main effect of learning place as a paired sample t-test. And if you're looking, um, we've got paired sample data, right? Subjects one in each condition and measures on each. We could convert this to a one sample t-test just by simply finding the vector of different scores. Now, there's a couple of ways we could do this. Um, let's use dplyr. We can use the filter function. And we're going to say learning place equals on land. So when we do that, we extract a data frame with only the mean recall values for subjects one to five on land. All right. If we wanted to get these mean recall values, we could put a dollar sign here and get those. Oh, that didn't like that. Maybe we have to do it like this. Select the column mean recall. So there we have it. Just that one column. Um, and I'm not sure why we can't. Does that work? No. Oh boy. So I'm just going to call this land, or how about this, learning land. could call this one learning C, change this to on C. So that should give us learning land. And whoops, learning C, did that not work? Under C, oops. So we're filtering on C, but we need to be filtering under C. There we go. So if we take the mean recall scores in, in the learning land condition and subtract them from the mean recall scores in the learning C condition, we have a single vector of differences. The differences between subject one here in C18, subject one here in in land, 18 minus 26 is a difference of 8. 
So that's the difference between land and sea for subject one. This is the difference between land and sea for subject two, and so on. Now, if we put these into a t-test, it's a single vector, we're testing the hypothesis that there are no differences. We could, if we wanted to, we could set mu to zero, but that will give us our one sample t-test. And notice we're getting the same values as we got before. All right, so this is a way to demonstrate we can do the main effect of learning place as a one sample t-test. So let's do this for the main effect of testing place. Going to make a few changes. We want to save this in a testing place means variable. We're now going to group by testing place. I wanted to make sure that's the name testing place uppercase. Yep. So we have that here. If we wanted to do it as a paired sample test, we could do that here. So there we have our paired sample t-test. Remember this p-value 0.189. If we go up to the ANOVA, we should be able to find that it's the same here, 0.189. Yeah, quickly, you know, I suppose what we could do are changing, well, let's just write it out. I was going to do a find all and find replace, but this isn't taking too long. All right. If we look at these, this vector of differences, then we should have um, the differences between subjects collapsing over the learning condition. I'm just looking at the testing condition. So if we looked at testing land and testing C, it looks like um, subjects three, four, and five, they had the same average scores so they're not different, uh, but subjects one and two are different. And so we're seeing those differences here, four and six. We could pop those into a t-test and then we'd be conducting a one sample t-test on the average differences between subjects for this condition. Okay, so we've done the main effects and re-express them as different scores and um, shown that a one sample t-test produces the same results as the ANOVA. How do we do it for the interaction? So what we need to think about here is what sets of different scores are we represent the interaction. All right, let's do the interaction. So this time we're going to be working with the whole data frame for the gotten badly example data. I'm gonna clean this up a little bit. All right, so let's think about this. We've got this whole data frame. And what I wanna do is grab some numbers. Let's think about um, learning place equals on land, that's a starting point 
and testing place equals on land. All right, so if we did that, whoops, we need to capitalize the land. All right, so here's one of the conditions. Now, I want to be able to grab this column here for these recall scores. Before we did that using select, I forgot about pull actually. So let's look at what pull does. It's going to pull these scores right out. And uh, so those are the recall scores for each subject for these conditions. Now, let's do this one more time. But I'm thinking about changing the testing place here. So this is going to be on undersea, right? So those are the testing scores, the recall scores when um, participants were on land during learning and undersea during test. Now, basically, what's being held constant here is the learning place. So this is the learning place on land level. So everyone here learned on land, but uh, between the testing place conditions, they were, there's, the test took place on land or undersea. So we could find it if we were looking for a different score, we'd be looking at the testing place difference, whether it mattered if you were on land or undersea, just for the on land condition. So how do we get those different scores? Basically, we want to subtract this vector from that one. I'm going to call this um, LP land testing, um, well, okay, let's just call it land land, and we'll call this one land C. And we're going to adopt the convention that the first letter tells us the learning place and the second letter tells us the testing place. So what I'm saying is we can take LL minus LS and that tells us if there's any differences between testing on land and sea for the uh, learning place on land level. Let's do this one more time. However, we're going to change the learning place to under C. So we'll now have SL and SS. We can get that same difference. Okay. So let's say when you test, you're just better on land than under sea. If you're better on land than under sea, then you have higher rescores, sorry, higher recall scores here than here. So this difference should be positive because you'd be taking big numbers and subtracting little numbers. In this case, those numbers are all positive, suggesting that people were 
better remembering things on land than on sea, under, under, the, under the water. Now, if that just happened no matter where you learned things, we'd find that same difference here because this is when people are tested on land, they should be better, and here's when they're tested underwater, and they should be worse. So we'd expect to find positive values here also. And in this case, the, the effect of testing place would be the same across the levels of the learning place variable. If we look at these different scores, we see negatives. And so clearly the effect of the testing place changes across the levels of the learning place. And um, we can compare those things more directly by subtracting these two things from each other. So this vector right here represents the size of the difference um, or the interaction, sort of the, the difference between the differences. All right, so this is a single vector of five values, and it effe effectively represents the interaction effect for each subject. So we could put this into a t-test, and what we're gonna get is a one sample t-test that is a test of the interaction in this design. Let's compare it to the ANOVA All right, so we found a p-value of 0 0.011. That's the same as the interaction effect here. The f-value was 20. Our t-value was 4.4721. But if we square this, we get a 20. Okay. So that is, that is the solutions, some solutions to all of the questions for lab nine. There's some bonus questions here, and they're about the sphericity concept. All right, so let's head into these bonus questions. Remember, uh, this is some example data from the textbook where the sphericity issues are brought up in, I think, chapter 18. Uh, or chapter 17, I guess. One of the two. <laughs> um, all right, this is the lab stuff from... All right, let's, let's head into here. So create a line plot showing how each of the five subjects perform across the levels of the independent variable. Discuss how the line plot visually shows the sphericity problem in the data. So all this is asking you to do is take this data, which we can load in now, and make a line plot so we can see how each subject is performing across those levels. I don't know if I've loaded up tidy R yet. And let's take the sphericity data and pivot longer. We're gonna need this to be in long format to put it into ggplot. So we wanna pivot th this data frame sphericity. I'm just going to 
load up the help file here so I can make sure I know what I'm doing. So the first thing is the data. We've got that sphericity. The second thing is the names of the columns you want to pivot longer. That's these ones. There's a little trick. You can say columns. In my case, I don't want the first column to pivot longer. Sorry. So exclamation S. So that means all columns except this one. All columns that aren't this one. There's a lot of options here. The main ones we need are names two. Now this is going to be, what are we going to call these four levels of the independent variable? I'm going to say, let's call it IV, independent variable. That'll be the name of the column for the independent variable. We also have values two. What are we going to call these numbers in here? They're going to get their own column, so we need to call it something. I'll call it DV. So now we've pivoted longer. And we can pop this right into ggplot x is going to be our independent variable y will be our dependent variable let's make color it's going to be s our s variable we can make some points we can make some lines oops and uh, Oh, the lines didn't connect. I think we need, in this case, set the group to S. All right, so there's your line graph. And it's up to you to discuss the sphericity problem here. Um, I will briefly say if you read the textbook on this issue, um, sphericity is defined in terms of uneven patterns of covariation between the levels. And you, we could think about that in terms of how the values in level A1 will correlate with the values in the other levels. So is this order of participants? So red, green, green, blue, purple. If we correlated these values with these ones here, we can see the correlation is not positive. It's, uh, or it's not perfectly positive, right? There's some going up and down here. So the correlation between uh, level A1 and level A2 is gonna be more positive than this correlation than that correlation. So the correlations between the levels are different, indicating a, that they're, well, because they're different, um, we've got basically an interaction between the subjects and the independent variable. We can kind of see that with the lines too. They're not all parallel here. We've got some crisscrossing of the lines. So per perhaps you could say one way the line plot visually shows the sphericity problem is that it shows there's an interaction effect between the subjects and the independent variable because the lines aren't parallel to one another. So the next question is modify the above data to remove the sphericity problem, specifically ensure that all subjects are different from one another. Uh, oops their overall means are different, and that the IV has the same effect for each level, and each subject no interaction. Uh, then plot the new data and discuss how the graph shows the sphericity problem has been removed. Okay, let's try to do that. We'll grab this data here. Uh, 
And I, as I'm looking at this problem, I'm like, oh boy, I don't, I don't have a systematic way to do this. Um, so I think I'm just gonna start with one of these subjects, subject number one, and try to make subject number one a particular, consi cons consist in a particular way and then make every other subject comport to that. Um, so there's, there's like tons of ways we could do this. How about let's take the pattern for subject number one and make that pattern basically the same for everybody else. What does that mean? It looks like subject one and two kind of have the same pattern already for level A1 to A2. However, between A2 and A3, we've got a different effect. So I wanna make subject two look more like subject one. So subject one goes down by that amount. I wanna make sure subject two goes down by that exact same amount. So I'm just going to, um, <laughs> let's see. This is some by hand stuff that I'm gonna do. So what is the effect for subject number one between level one and two? It's a difference of 12, goes down by 12. And I can see that subject two goes down by 12. That's great. Well, well, let's, let's just work on all the subjects for this first part. How about subject three? They start at 58, down by 12 would be 46. So I'm gonna put that 46 here. 46 going down by 12 for the next subject, that's a 34. So I'm changing that to 34. 30 down by 12, did we get that? No, that's more than 12. No, it is 12, great. So with this new data, let's just see what I'm doing real quick. This one, this one, all right. So as you can see, every subject now goes down by 12 between level A1 and A2. Starting to follow subject one. Let's work on A2 to A3. So subject one goes down by uh, 44, by 20. Let's make subject two go down by 20. And this subject is gonna go down by 20. Same with this one, same with this one here. So that's for down by 20, we're gonna to go to minus two. Uh, so I have this 64 to 34 is a minus 30. Oh boy, I can't, can't do subtraction right now. So we're gonna to have to make this 18. 16, and four, and negative 12. All right. So basically what we're doing is removing the interaction effect just kind of by eyeballing things and choosing one subject to base off, base this removal off of. Let's do A3 to A4, make subjects two, three, four, and five have the same effect as subject number one here. So that's going down by eight, looks like. Let me just type it in, 34 minus 26 is eight. So 18 minus eight, 16 minus eight is gonna be eight, 28 minus four, sorry. Four minus eight, I'm gonna go to minus four. And here we're gonna to go to minus 20. All right. So now we have differences between subjects, differences between levels, but um, all the lines are parallel, showing that the main effect is the same for 
every subject is consistent across all the levels. There's now no interaction between the, the subject means and the levels of the independent variable. So there we've done it. We've removed the sphericity problem. Okay, calculate the greenhouse geyser estimate of epsilon for your modified data to demonstrate you have removed the sphericity problem. Okay, let's do that. So here's the data with the sphericity problem removed. And I would suggest, I mean, if you want to just head over to lab nine and uh, there's this bunch of code here more than one way to do it. Um, we could grab this code that we used to calculate the estimate of epsilon. I think it's set up to be evaluating a, uh, a data frame called textbook that's in the same organization. So I'm just gonna Oops, I'm just going to call, I'm going to create a variable called textbook. And I think originally the, the data set from the textbook, the unmodified data, had a greenhouse geyser estimate of epsilon for, of around 0.44. And this was an example of showing you how to do all the steps. Oops, what's going on here? One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hmm. Okay, here's our table. Two, three, four, five. Oh, these are just demonstrations. Right, so we double center the covariation matrix, compute greenhouse geyser, and we get not a number. So this, um, <laughs> here's, here's maybe a, a better way to do this, um, just to see that the correction is being applied. Sorry, we have eliminated the sphericity problem. If we were to take each of these columns here and correlate them with any other column, we can do that using the core function. Let's see what we get. We get a perfect correlation between every column and every other column. It means the pattern across subjects within one level is the exact same in every other level. They're perfectly correlated with each other. And, you know, this is a kind of example of circular data, I would guess. If we didn't look at the correlation coefficients and we looked at the covariances, which aren't normalized, we can see we have the same covariance everywhere. Now, if you don't have the same covariance everywhere, it means that the patterns across subjects within each level aren't the same across the levels. So that is indicative of an interaction effect and it makes the data not spherical. So we can't calculate um, greenhouse geyser when everything's perfectly normal here. And we'll get that NAN. All right, so we've demonstrated here that we've removed the sphericity problem by going through these steps. Okay, that is the lab nine plus the bonus questions. And hopefully this video had the right aspect ratio. We'll see you next week.